Good afternoon, everyone. Great to join you today. So five years ago today, nine innocent parishioners of a historically black church were killed during an evening Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina. We all remember that tragedy, and this was a despicable act of evil that happened five years ago today. So we remember that somber day at that Charleston church as our hearts still break for the victims and our prayers go out to the families. Yesterday, President Trump led and brought our nation together behind real, meaningful, substantial change to ensure that we have safe streets and safe policing. Part of that was having an incentive structure to implement the highest professional standards in our police departments through an accreditation process. Uh, this accreditation entails making sure you have de-escalation practices in place, use of force tactics in place. Part of that is prohibiting chokeholds, um, except in the event where lethal force is used. It also um, incentivizes information sharing and makes sure that if you have an officer who's had multiple uses of excessive force, that that information is sent to a national database. And then finally, another prong of this was having co-responders who are experts in mental health go alongside law enforcement because we know our law enforcement officials often have to deal with mental health, homelessness, and addiction, and having a co-responder who is an expert in this process um, will go a long way. This is project, it's progress, it's tangible action, and it's solutions. And today, as Senator Tim Scott said, this is not a binary choice between supporting police officers and between supporting victims of grave injustices like George Floyd. It's not a binary choice. There are not sides here. This is about America coming together. This is about human decency, and this is about justice. And when we see injustices, we recognize them. As President Trump said yesterday, all children deserve equal opportunity because we are all made equal by God. Uh, that is so true. Um, first, let me point out that I have sat across from a police officer family that lost their loved one. I saw a little girl uh, named Charlie who will forever grow up without a father, who will forever grow up um, without a father for prom, for the father-daughter dance. And it was heartbreaking to know that she lost uh, her father, who was a valiant hero. But yesterday, I sat across from families who lost their loved ones um, in mass instances of injustice. And it was heartbreaking to hear their stories. It was a real tragedy. Um, it was a tearful moment. It was an emotional moment. And it's one that the president, when I asked him in the Oval Office about afterwards, he said this, I love those families. I want to help those families. And President Trump means that, because this is about humanity. That is ultimately what this is about. And Senator Scott shared a very beautiful Bible verse um, with those families yesterday, and I just want to read it here to close. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He shared that Bible verse with those families, and it was particularly meaningful to me, and I think to the families as well. And with that, I'll take questions. Yes. First of all, you do a great job dealing with that feedback. I know that's not, mixed that's not very mixed minus. It's the worst. Yes. Thank you. All right, so the Trump administration, the Trump Justice Department, has appointed six U.S. attorneys to examine the actions of the president's political adversaries, but they've only opened one federal investigation into systemic bias in policing. So my question to you is, why are so many resources being allocated to make sure the president and his allies were treated fairly by law enforcement and not the same for millions of black Americans. So I think you're comparing two things um, that it's, it's not accurate to compare on the level of the number There's of attorneys department looking, investigations. looking it into. Um, first, we all know that this administration was dragged four years through a bogus investigation founded upon a dossier full of lies funded by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. It was an injustice to the American people who elected President Trump as President of the United States, who was then bogged down by an investigation, uh, which ended up with two words no collusion. Um, but there that's were convictions, one, there were guilty pleas. That's the first part of your question, but as to the second part, uh, this president's taken real, tangible, concrete action on the issue of policing. We saw that yesterday. Guess who hasn't led? Democrats. Uh, they've engaged in um, meaningless symbolism as we saw them, you know, kneeling for minutes on end. But this president isn't about gestures. It's not about symbolism. It's about action. It's about making sure someone like George Floyd never dies in that manner ever again. I mentioned racial bias yesterday, nor does that executive order. 
This, first of all, this executive order addresses the issue at hand, and I thought my colleague, Jerron Smith, handled this really well yesterday when he said this about the executive order on this very question. Um, from you, he said, a lot of people want to make it about race, but it's about communities and individuals. You're trying to fix something that you can't really fix the heart of people, but you can fix individual pieces that deal with the real problem, which is access to opportunity. You can fix schools um, and remedy the disparities we see in schooling. You can fix policing to the degree we can at the federal level to incentivize good behavior and fair practices. You can fix the economy, as President Trump has done. He brought about the lowest economic um, employment rate for African-American individuals on a paychecks going up prior to this pandemic when we had to artificially shut down the economy. You can fix the individual pieces, um, but it's up to our country to change hearts. Yes. Um, does the president, the president talked about chokeholds yesterday, the bill that's been unveiled by the Republican Senator Scott and the Republicans does not ban chokeholds. Does he think it should? Um, the president is fully in support of the Scott bill. They are working closely um, on that and REO puts an end to that or incentivizes through the accreditation process to put an end to chokeholds um, in the, unless there is lethal force used. We fully support um, the Scott bill and every element of it. And one thing um, I would note about the Scott bill is for years we've tried to make lynching a federal crime in this country and the Scott bill does it. It's a great bill. It's more great action from Republicans and we hope we can have bipartisan but, support. But, but, to, but to be clear, the executive order does not ban chokeholds, and you can't actually do that, I don't believe, through an executive order. And this bill does not ban chokeholds. Do, do you think, does the president think, that chokeholds simply should be banned? So what I, what I have from the Justice Act here is that this will also end the practice of utilizing chokeholds. And I would underscore the executive order does that through an incentivizing process. So we've done what we can, and we'll continue to do more, and we'll continue to work with the Scott Bill, and there might be amendments to it, there might not, but we want to see this come to fruition. Because it doesn't sense it doesn't actually ban the practice. It, it, it encourages, but it does not actually ban the practice. Yes, well, that is, the we're, we're work incentivizing is. to ban chokeholds unless in the case of where lethal force is used. Um, that's the process that we're using, and I'll tell you this, it's a much better process than the Democrats, who so far have offered zero, nothing, except a lot of bad ideas about this that would ultimately, I would note, defund the police department. Yes. Dr. Kaylee, in the last day, uh, 96 uh, people in Tulsa have contracted the coronavirus. Uh, wondering about this rally coming up on Saturday, will the president or the White House take responsibility if people get sick? and catch the coronavirus at this rally on Saturday? So the campaign has taken certain measures um, to make sure this is a safe rally, temperature checks, hand sanitizers, and masks, so we are taking precautions. But you're not requiring people to wear masks? They will be given a mask. It's up to them whether to make that decision. CDC guidelines are recommended, but not required. And the CDC guidelines uh, suggest that people practice social distancing. You're not gonna be able to practice social distancing in a rally with thousands of people. So aren't you, in essence, uh, bringing people to a rally where they won't be abiding by it's, those guidelines? It's adhering a to those guidelines. personal choice of individuals as to what to do, but if we want to talk about internal coherence, um, I believe that the media needs to work on internal coherence. This wonderful New York Post story, I don't think Stephen Nelson's here, but good job to New York Post, highlights the hypocrisy of the media where this is okay, protesting. This is not okay, Trump rallies. Um, it's really remarkable, and I think the American people have taken notice when, for instance, NBC tweets at 4.05 p.m. Um, on June 14th, Rally for Black Trans Lives draws packed crowds from Brooklyn Museum Plaza, seeming, seeming to be lauding the protests, and then less than an hour and a half later, they say President Trump plans to rally, but health experts are questioning that decision. CBS had a similar yeah, Kaylee, these logically are, these, are, these are protesters protesting against injustice, against racism and police brutality. This is a rally, a political rally. They're, they're not going to be demonstrating for any kind of cause other than supporting the president. And I go back to my original question, will the White House, will the president take responsibility if there are people who catch the coronavirus and get sick? As yeah. you know, you've been to these rallies. So Many of the people who go to the rallies, I've been to them too, yes. are elderly, uh, probably have uh, pre-existing conditions that might put them at risk uh, for serious complications if they catch this virus. So first, let me know, you've been to rallies, these Trump rallies. Um, we do rally in support of something. We rally in support of the president who got us the lowest 
number of black unemployment in the history of our country and paychecks going up. We rally that HBCU funding for historically black colleges and universities is permanent because right. of President Trump. You're not Trump. answering my question. Will the president, will the White House take responsibility if people get sick? Will, can, you, can you answer that question? suggested that we don't rally on behalf of anything. So let me note one more thing. We rally I, I said on behalf that you rally on behalf of the president. We rally That's why on you're going. behalf of criminal justice reform and the First Step Act, which President Obama and Vice President Biden talked about, but we did. And I would note this, if we want to talk about the efficacy of what we're doing, 1,300 health experts signed a letter about the protest saying, we do not condemn these gatherings, we support them as vital. So you have the health experts on one side saying this, and okay. then all of a sudden you're, a Trump rally is around, You're dancing around the question. You're holding up a newspaper headline. That's, that's very nice. Work on your internal cohesion and get back to me, Jim. Yes, yes please. Uh, Ms. Beckany, uh, you have not answered the question. Will the president, will the I've White House? I've answered five of your questions. But my first last, question has not been answered. Will I, the president, I, will I the White House take responsibility if people get sick? I said to you, we're taking precautions. Mask. So you're not going to take responsibility. Kaylee, so for attendees at, at this rally, the, the campaign is requiring them to sign a waiver and th to waive them of liability, uh, acknowledging that there is an assumed risk with going to that rally. Does not the president have some responsibility himself to ensure, uh, to set an example for the nation to stop, you know, to prevent these larger gatherings or ensuring social distancing so that the American people and people around the world, for that matter, follow his example and, 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 and preserve the, the most safe environment. Why is, not, is the president not following CDC guidance in doing that? We are doing temperature checks, hand sanitizers, masks. When you come to the rally, um, as if any event, you assume a personal risk. Um, that is just what you do. When you go to a baseball game, you assume a risk. Um, that's part of life. It's the personal decision of Americans as to whether to go to the rally or whether not to go to the rally. But I would note that this concern for the rallies um, has been largely absent when it came to the protesters. People really note um, when CBS says thousands participate in a rally and a silent march for black trans lives and then less than, this is more than an hour and a half later, President Trump moving ahead with the rally, serious risk of spreading coronavirus. It's really inconsistent. The media seems to not be interested in health so much as ideology behind certain events. So, you know, for instance, you go and the lockdown protesters were widely condemned by the media who were protesting the lockdown, but then all of a sudden this protest for Black Lives Matter is lauded. It makes no sense. Ideology is driving the line of questioning in many of these cases, um, when it should be if you're focused on science, you should be out there asking these same questions well, about Kaylee, the uh, Public health officials here, local officials, mayors and lords in many of the cities where there have been protests, have encouraged those who attended those large gatherings and others to get tested four or five days after their attendance at the event. Does the president want attendees at his own rally on Saturday to get tested four or five days later to make sure that uh, they didn't get, get the virus there? And, to, and to, who should they inform if they do come down with the virus after the, after the rally? It's, it's their personal decision as to whether they want to get tested after. But I'd note um, testing capability is thanks to President Trump, 23.7 million people tested in this country so far. That's an extraordinary number. So testing's out there and available if someone chooses to do that. Sorry, yeah. wait, one more, excuse me. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, has the White House been monitoring uh, this outbreak of violence between uh, Indian and Chinese uh, troops? And uh, does the White House have, have any reaction? Is the president uh, getting on the phone and talking to the, uh, to the relevant countries there? So the president is aware of it. We're monitoring the situation uh, between Indian and Chinese forces along the line of actual control in eastern uh, Ladakh. So we've seen that the Indian Army statement that 20 Indian soldiers died as a result of the confrontation today, and we extend our deepest condolences on that. Jeff, um, to follow up on Z, has the Coronavirus Task Force been consulted? Have they done any modeling on how many people could get sick at the Tulsa rally or, or die from the Tulsa rally? Have they even been consulted about, about the rally? The Coronavirus Task Force for some, you know, they're meeting today. I would first point that out. Um, they meet regularly and they monitor the whole country. So they don't zone in on a Trump rally. They zone in on the whole country and analyze it through a database lens. So they haven't specifically done modeling on, on the rally? They That's look right. at the entirety of the country. That would include the state of Oklahoma, but they look at all 50 states in close consultation uh, with governors. Uh, Jay Powell this morning, um, the, the Fed chairman, Jay Powell this morning, said um, that he thinks it would be appropriate for there to be more federal stimulus. Does the White House have any comment on his conversation? Um, you know, it's something that's being looked at, of course, a phase four, no announcements on what those elements would be and would want to get out ahead of the president. But I would note that 
this economy is robust um, and growing and coming back stronger than anyone could think from this because of the president. I mean, you look at retail sales surging 17.7%. Unemployment insurance weekly claims falling. Um, we have the fastest growth rate in American history in the third quarter. So we artificially shut down the economy, but we have a robust um, recovery happening and taking place. And that's thanks to President Trump. And there are a lot of good metrics um, like new business applications skyrocketing, small businesses now opening at about 80%, Apple Mobility Index. That's practically pre-pandemic level. So there's more work to be done. A phase four will address um, that should it take place, uh, but we are encouraged by what we're seeing that the Donald Trump economy um, is coming back because ultimately investors and business owners have faith in this president. Okay. Yes. Jeff. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, you mentioned testing just now, and the president has also both been tweeting and uh, saying publicly on Monday that if the country just stopped testing, that there would be no or virtually no cases left. That, that doesn't make sense. Can you explain what he means by that? Yeah, it's entirely logical. When you do more testing, you identify more cases. Countries that don't do as much testing don't identify the same number of cases. I mean, it's pretty logical, exactly what he said. Okay, so it's about identifying them, because he seemed to suggest that if, they, if we weren't testing, then those cases wouldn't exist. Is that is just, no, that that, just a misunderstanding? That was, a, that was not at all what he was saying. He was saying when you test, you end up identifying more cases, and we've tested 23.7 million people, um, a positivity rate of 5.9%, um, so we are in a good place when it comes to testing. And just along those same lines, um, the Vice President today wrote an op-ed, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. Um, playing down the prospects of a second wave. Does the White House, is the White House just confident that there's not going to be a second wave of the coronavirus? The White House is confident that we have enough testing to identify asymptomatic individuals, that we have therapeutics that are promising, that we are working on a vaccine with Project Warp Speed that we hope will be there by the end of the year and we think will be, and we have a robust public-private partnership uh, that has shored up America's supply chain. So we are in a good place, and that's what the Vice President was noting, John. Thanks a lot, Bailey. Uh, two subjects. Uh, the first question has to do with the lawsuit that was filed against John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor, by the Department of Justice yesterday. The DOJ did not file a lawsuit against Simon & Schuster, uh, nor did it file an injunction against the publisher. Why not? Uh, do you still expect this book to, to hit bookstores, to be on Amazon, to be available for people to read on the 23rd of this month? So that, as to why they went down that particular path, that's a question for DOJ. But what I would note is this book is full of classified information, uh, which is inexcusable. Um, former National Security Advisor John Bolton should know all too well that it's unacceptable uh, to have highly classified information from the government of the United States um, in a book that will be published. It's unacceptable. Uh, it has not gone through the review process. Um, and that's where we currently stand. And I'd refer you back to Barr's comment on this, which is we don't believe that Bolton went through that process. It's, it hasn't been completed, the process, and therefore he is in violation of that agreement. That was part of his quote from Monday. Yeah, on the other subject, uh, the executive order the president signed yesterday during uh, that event and his comments, he acknowledged that there are indeed bad police officers. Is the president opposed to the idea of removing qualified immunity for police officers, even bad police officers? Yes, yeah, so qualified immunity, um, let me note, is a, a total and complete non-starter. What qualified immunity um, would do is it would really enable the police in this country to do their job. That's in the Democrat bill, and I'd argue this. You know, Democrats, uh, they say defund the police, defund the police. We hear that from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and Congresswoman Omar and others. Well, what does the Democrat bill do? By removing qualified immunity, what you're essentially doing is not allowing police to do their job. There would be um, a decrease in policing in this country. Our streets would not be safe. What President Trump has done is worked with law enforcement to improve law enforcement, to ensure that the the bad cops that exist are pushed out of the system. The overwhelming majority of cops are good, so we've got to address uh, the, the handful that are bad, and that's what the president's order has done. But taking away qualified immunity would make the streets of this country a whole lot less secure. Uh, just look at what happened when we didn't have ample law enforcement out on Lafayette Square. Uh, a church burned and multiple officers injured. So how do you handle yes, the situation, Kelly, uh, of a bad police officer? 
hiding behind the shield of qualified immunity. Look, I would note that also the court has litigated this um, pretty strongly. It's been um, adjudicated. The Harlow Court, in that decision, Harlow, the Supreme Court, talked about achieving a balance um, between allowing victims to hold officials accountable while also minim minimizing the social cost to the whole, the cost of police officers, for example, pulling back. Uh, so the Supreme Court has litigated this um, for decades um, and has approached what they think is the appropriate balance with qualified immunity. And I think it would go a long way just doing what the president did yesterday, having that national database of offenders so we ensure that a police officer um, doesn't leave one uh, department and then go to another. Francesca. Thank you, Kaylee. You outlined the White House's position on qualified immunity, defunding the police, but you also said earlier that the Democratic bill is full of bad ideas. What are the other quote unquote bad ideas besides those two that the president would not sign a policing bill if they wound up in the final version? So one of the things um, the bill does is it undermines due process. The Democrat bill um, would undermine the due process rights of every officer by making pending and unsubstantial allegations available to the public causing reputational, reputational damage based on allegations alone. That's a really good example because what our database does is once a claim has been adjudicated, we know something was done wrong. It goes into a database that remains private. It protects privacy of the officers, but it is utilized to ensure that officer does not get to go to another department. What the Democrat bill would do is someone submits an allegation, well, we're going to violate the due process rights of this officer and put it into a system. Um, we have to balance everything in this situation, um, making sure our good, hardworking, overwhelmingly good police officers are able to do their job, but ensuring that we do not have victims um, like the, the victims I heard about yesterday and the excruciating, painful, devastating stories of their sisters, of their mothers, and of their fathers. So, sorry, uh, one other question on that and something else. So you're saying those are the three? That's it? Uh, there, there's a number of things, but those are the ones that I've listed out so far. But there's right. a number and, of and, and on the though. president's rallies, he has also said that he has rallies on the books in North Carolina and also Florida, two states that have seen recent spikes in coronavirus. Uh, who told the president that it would be safe to have rallies in states that are seeing spikes right now? We are confident that um, there are embers out there that exist that will be able to put out those embers. Uh, Florida has a great governor. He's done a great job so far. We work closely with Governor DeSantis, and uh, we believe that we will be at a safe who place. Who said it was safe? Yes. Uh, Kaylee, um, uh, the uh, Gors Justice Gorsuch's decision from the Supreme Court this week against anti-LGBT discrimination was uh, focused on employment civil rights law, but also have implications on housing, health care. Um, to what, how does the president want to see this implemented? Does he want it implemented as extensively or as narrowly as possible? So what the president says is he's read the decision, they've ruled, we live with the decision, and we live with the decision of the Supreme Court. So that's where he stands currently. Um, and in terms of how it's implement, implemented, DOJ will lead the multi-agency effort to help provide certainty to the regulated parties. I understand DOJ's role, but uh, the president also has the opportunity to express his, his, his opinion and to lead, much like President Obama in 2013, said he hoped the marriage decision from the Supreme Court would be uh, implemented as, as extensively as possible. What is President Trump's view on the appropriate scope of the Gorsuch decision? So DOJ will be guiding that entirely. So I will leave that to DOJ. And finally, will the president have any conversations with the DOJ about the implementation of, of the Gorsuch decision? Um, not that I'm aware of. He no. might have had one I don't know about, but not that I'm aware of. Question. Does the president think that the Gors the uh, Bostock decision is a win for civil rights? Sorry? Does the president think the Gorsuch decision is a win for civil rights? So one thing I would say, um, I have not talked to the president about that personally, but one thing I wanted to read um, was from the Kavanaugh dissent. There were some real concerns um, that this was a complete uh, distortion of how we do statutory interpretation. Um, and Kavanaugh lays that out very nicely. Uh, but one thing Justice Kavanaugh did say, and I thought it was a very powerful quote, um, is, notwithstanding my concern about the court's transgression of the Constitution's separation of powers, which was a grave concern as a separation of powers point that the DOJ, um, that the DOJ argued in court, um, it is appropriate to acknowledge the important victory achieved today um, by gay and lesbian Americans. So I thought that that was a very good quote um, from Justice Kavanaugh. Yes. Yep. On the Alexandra. Thank you. Um, on the plan to reduce U.S. troops in Germany, uh, is there a timeline you can share with us? And could this decision, this plan, be changed or softened if Berlin agreed to increase its defense spending? 
So the president addressed um, our presence, uh, American troop presence in Germany, and he said we're bringing that number down um, from 52,000, about what it's at now, to 25,000. And the rationale for that he articulated was that Germany is very delinquent in their payments to NATO. They're paying 1 percent. They are supposed to be at 2 percent. And even 2 percent is low. It should be much more than that. Um, Mike, would he change? His plan if Germany agreed to uh, increase I wouldn't get ahead of the president on making that decision. Michael. Hi, thanks, Kaylee. I uh, have one question, and then I have two quick questions from colleagues who have sent to me as the pool person. So um, on my question, back when uh, two White House officials uh, were test tested positive for COVID, there, we all reported on an email that went out to West Wing employees instructing them uh, that m masks were mandatory to be worn in the West Wing at all times, with the exception of being when they were sitting at their desks alone. Um, obviously, none of the White House people that I've seen today have been wearing masks at all. Um, has, has that been rescinded? Has that, has that instruction to West Wing employees been, in, been rescinded formally, or is it just still in place but nobody's paying attention so to it or masks are recommended but not required required excuse me as i said two, two quick questions Could i, I want to get to everyone in the room well, these so are, these are from people who can't be in the room because of the restrictions so i understand I can, but i want to make sure i get to everyone in the room and then we can come back okay. so rob um can i just get a clarification on your equivalence between uh protests in the streets and the uh, rally on saturday <clears throat> Um, is it the White House position that outdoor events carry the same risk as indoor events? It's our position uh, that the media should not be making decisions about their their guidelines to us about social distancing based on political ideology or what they think is the worthiness of the cause. My point is there are good scientific reasons for treating the two events differently. One is outdoors and one is indoors. Right, and there's not good logical reason for this. So that's the one thing I would keep going back to. And can um, I also ask yes, you, Owen. Is anything about the Secretary of State's uh, trip to Hawaii to meet his uh, Chinese counterpart? So I have no information on that. But yeah. Owen. <laughs> yes. Blake. Different mask. Oh, sorry, Blake. <laughs> you, they subbed you in. No Blake. worries, no worries. Good uh, to see you, Blake. You too. A couple on the economic front. Uh, earlier this month, in Maine, the president was talking about Maine lobster, and he said the following. He said, "If the European Union doesn't drop that tariff immediately, we're going to put a tariff on their cars, which will be equivalent." Can you give us an update on that? What is immediately? What is the status of potential tariffs on EU autos? I haven't inquired about that today, but I will inquire about that, um, and I'll try to get back to you before five if that works. And secondly, um, an infrastructure bill. Can mm -hmm. you just sort of give us a broad outline of what the administration wants to see? Is that a reauthorization of the highway bill that comes up at the end of the year? Is that added on to a potential phase four stimulus? What is the administration, what does the White House want as it relates to yeah, infrastructure? I don't want to get ahead of the administration on our official plans for that. Infrastructure is something we've talked about for a long time, and it's something that we think that we could find common ground on. Um, but it's up to Democrats to really come to us and, and make that happen. It's been mentioned as potentially a phase four, but that's not in stone. Um, but that has been mentioned. No formalized plans, though, on where infrastructure stands. Is that a trillion dollars? Um, is it a trillion dollars? Up to we don't have a, a number on that right now. Um, yes. Uh, on the Tulsa rally, can you give us a sense of which health experts the campaign and the White House consulted before deciding to hold it? Did anyone talk to the CDC about whether it would be a good idea? Look, we are taking every single safety precaution uh, that we can. And again, I would note this is probably question number 10 on rallies. And while we appreciate the great concern for our rally goers, um, you should exhibit that same concern for the protesters who are out there who are not socially distancing in many cases and not wearing masks. Chanel. Thank you, Kaylee. Going back to the international front on China and India, you just mentioned that the administration is monitoring the situation. But <clears throat> the president has mentioned that he would be willing to mediate the, uh, ten the conflict between China and India now. If you were to do so, what does that look like? Does that mean, does that look like a one on one conversation? Does that mean bringing the two leaders together? Has the president indicated what mediation looks like for China and India? Um, so again, no, no formal plans on that beyond what I already said and expressing our absolute um, condolences to the Indian soldiers that died as a result of today's confrontation. We extend our deepest condolences there. Um, and I would note just that during the phone call on June 2nd of this year that President Trump had with Prime Minister Modi, they did discuss the situation on the India-China border. On the relationship between President Trump and President Xi, um, the Chinese forces have been moving thousands of troops to that region. That It doesn't seem like that region is going to see de-escalation anytime soon. 
if you were to characterize President Trump's relationship with President Xi today, would, yeah. you, would I, you venture into that realm? I, I would just say what the President has said before, um, that he is really appalled at the fact uh, that the, uh, the coronavirus came out of China. They weren't allowing um, flights into China, but were allowing flights out. They slow walked information. Uh, the WHO uh, seemed to partner with China in slow walking that information about asymptomatic spread. Um, so that is an appalling uh, state of events, and the President is very upset. Um, by that action of China, or inaction in some cases, I should say. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great rest of the day. And I hope we start seeing more consistent headlines. Thanks very much.